What you are showing, so seeing uh, in front of your screen is the information relating the Avias data uh, and all the rights of, of, of the information that the university is collecting when you're registered here, okay? So just to translate a little bit about that, no? Uh, I think we can we can start at 12.10, 12, 12, I, I think in, in two minutes. Um, so we, we so to, 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 to start, okay, very soon, okay? Joana, 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 Andrea, Andrea, Andrea. Señor profe. Sí, señor. Que, es que ahorita quisiera que, que dos, eh, que dos eh, que están conectadas puedan hablar. Eh, a ver si le damos micrófono también a Mario Decten y a, y a, y a Dorotea von Hantelman. ¿no? Claro que sí. 
I'm, 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 I just want them to give you the to to be able to speak because I want you to to also be into in the in the introduction of the talk, okay? Or you can about the project and all that, okay? Okay. Should we start? Alex, empezamos, Andrea. Should we start? Sí, señor. Juan, I just wanted to check if YouTube Live is connecting because it's not appearing for me. Eh, eh, okay, eh, Alex, el, 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 ¿ya está funcionando o es apenas empecemos? Está funcionando, ya está funcionando en este profe, momento. Ya estamos. Ok, ok. They show me that this, this talk is being uh, reproduced uh, real time by YouTube, ok? No? Uh, perhaps uh, uh, I'm going to, 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 to tell uh, 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 to send you again the link to the YouTube uh, transmission, ok? Alex, ¿será que puedes por, eh, mandar por, por el chat otra vez eh, la conexión de YouTube? El link de YouTube. ¿Listos? Sí, listos. Vamos a empezar. ¿Listos? Andrea, Alex, ¿listos? Ok, let's, let's start here, ok? Ok, uh, I am excited. We are excited. This is very, very important what is happening here. Um, three campuses, three countries, all the people I know, all the people in other places, you know. Um, thank you, Matthew, for inviting, for, for accepting the invitation. Uh, thank you, Pamela Gupta, also for, for, for making this possible. Well, okay. Okay, first of all, uh, I need to, to, to say that the, what, what we're going to hear today uh, is part of a very experimental, creative, uh, challenging, experimental, a very pioneer project uh, that two people here that are responsible of this started a couple of months ago. No? Uh, Marion Decton and, and Dorothea Van, Van, Van Huntenman uh, wrote to me about eight months ago, something like that, and, and told me about this great idea of creating this cross country project on, on migration, on borders, on regi regimes of, 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 of regime control and all that. No, uh, I remember our first talk, I was in Trachi, in, uh, the, the connection was very bad and all that. But I, I, but I do think that that was crucial for beginning to 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 start this very exciting project. No, uh, so I just want to ask to thank uh, Dorothea and and and, and Marion for inviting me here. You're going to have to speak a little bit nowadays. So, but let, let me introduce a bit more. Okay. Uh, so this project is is this this talk is part of a big project, a uh, cross campus application between the 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 Bard College in Berlin. The University of Witwatersrand in South Africa and Los Andes in Bogota. Uh, the name of the project, of the large project, is going to be a two years project. I, I think, it, if I'm not wrong, it's called Research Question Initiative Forced Migrations and the Arts. No? Uh, so I, I don't know if, if you, Marion, and Dorothea want to speak a little bit, a little bit about the project, about where we are, and, and all that. Uh, uh, can we put uh, microphones for ellas? Let, let me see if I can. Ya los tienen, profe. Okay. okay. Works. Now you can speak. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Juan. This is really very, very exciting. And um, we've been waiting for this moment for a long time. Our classes have started already, and our students have gotten to know each other already. They have worked together already, have done readings together. Um, so the topic of the cross campus class that Juan and Dorothea and I are teaching at um Uni Andes and at Berlin at the same time is um, forced migration and the nation state and um, connecting research projects um, that the students are doing to the arts and the students um, eventually developing their own art projects um, that will be exhibited um, both in Berlin and in, Los, in, in, in Bogota, eventually, hopefully physically this summer, if uh, Corona allows. <laughs> yeah, so, and this is the first lecture. Um, um, 
from um, given from uh, uh, Johannesburg, our third partner um, with, and we are very very exciting that uh, excited that it's happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'll be very, very. I'll be very brief. Uh, I want to leave the time that we have uh, to our speaker. But uh, thank you all. It's super exciting. As Maya said, we've been working on this. This is the pilot project. It's uh, sponsored by Osun, uh, the so Open Society University Network. That for us is a huge opportunity to experiment to uh, with network classes, network projects, and this is our first try to do that. And so far, we've had our first cross campus class last week with Juan, with his students, with our students. It was super exciting and uh, can't wait to continue and then also to expand it to Johannesburg. This is our, our first uh, uh, attempt and, and effort to do that tonight, which is super, super exciting. So very uh, welcome to everyone. I'm super glad you're all there and, and uh, let's start with the journey. One we, we can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much again. I really want to thank again Pamela Gupta from, from South Africa, from BITS, for inviting Matthew. Matthew is in Brazil, actually, so it makes it even much more global, this, no? So, so we have a cross camp thing. Maybe Pamela, do you want to speak a little bit? Pamela? 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 Eh, eh, Alex, ¿le puedes dar eh, eh, voz a Pamela, por favor? Alex, Alex. Sí, yo, yo ya, Alex. ya, ya la estoy buscando. Okay, okay. Está. Pa Pamela, we want to give you the the microphone okay. if you want to say something. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. We can hear you. Someone is going to put you the microphone. Okay, good. No, se fue. Alex, okay. Yeah? Yeah, good. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm speaking from Johannesburg, and it's very nice to see everyone uh, um, coming together for this exciting talk Who's a, by Matthew, who's a colleague of mine here at WITS. Um, and I'm looking forward to this talk and developing this conversation uh, between South Africa, Colombia, and Germany. Uh, so this is the first iteration of that. So uh, I welcome you, Matthew, and we're looking forward to your talk today. So thank you. Okay, here we are. So let's start this. Okay, Matthew, Matthew Solomon is going to give you um, a lecture uh, with the title "Writing Migration, Displacement, and Affected Landscapes." Uh, you have the the biographical information of Matthew, so I will not go there. Matthew is going to talk for approximately like an hour, more or less. Uh, and then we have another hour to have discussions, questions, and answers, and addition of that. Okay, we've talked too much. It's time for Matthew. Matthew, thank you. Thank you very much for this. Okay, so you, you're open. Okay. Thanks. Can can everyone hear me? Okay. So, thanks. It's it's really great to be invited here. So thank you to Juan, Pamela, Kelly, and the others, and to connect from Brazil to Berlin, Johannesburg. To Bogota. It's my first real online talk, so it's a, a, an adventure for me too. So what I prepared today is neither a new paper nor an old one, but a series of reflections on the theme of writing, migration, displacement, and effective landscapes. Thinking back on some of my own writing um, over more than a decade on HIV AIDS and displacement in northern Uganda and migration, religion, and unlawful occupation in any city, Johannesburg, South Africa. I'll reflect on this lecture on both the practice and politics of writing about migration and displacement with ineffective landscapes and cityscapes. Now, if we conceive of effect as a primary and pre-linguistic relationship with the world, transforming effective experiences of the effective experiences of others into narrative is hopelessly flawed from the outset. So I propose in this lecture a relational approach to writing the journeys of displaced persons and migrants, which attends to how their effects are enmeshed in the landscape or cityscape's materiality. 
I think while I'll, I'll come later in the, the talk to some of the theory on affect, I really want this not to be pinned to a particular theoretical framework and to be really about the kind of writing process. And I think within, I've chosen effect here because effect points towards, sorry, I'm being bothered by a mosquito. Effect points towards this kind of intimate relationship between individuals, their networks of care and landscapes, which are both the present material landscapes, but also the landscapes of the past, of lo lost landscapes and Im imagined landscapes. And I think I conceive the writing process here not necessarily as one of representation of, of trying to represent the internal worlds and feelings of others, but, but one of a kind of disorientation and orientation that in the research and writing process, one becomes oriented towards landscapes that are maybe familiar but become estranged or, or maybe strange, but one is oriented within them in relationship to others. So when preparing this talk, um, I thought back to the beginning of my own MA research on HIV AIDS treatment to displaced communities in Northern Uganda, which I began in 2006 and later continued to adopt post cultural research. I'm oriented towards landscapes that are maybe familiar, but become estranged That's or, or maybe something in the code, which I think somebody's mic is on. Um, During this talk, um, I thought back to the beginning of so, um, the at, at the time, Uganda had this, I think, if I recall correctly, the second largest number of internally displaced persons in the world, with one and a half to two million displaced. At the time, if I'm correct, Colombia, in fact, had the most the largest number of internally displaced persons in the world. I looked at the statistics, I think it was around 3 million. I'm not sure if that was in total at the time, but you can speak to that. I'm sure most of you know this and have studied it in your course, but internally displaced persons are those forcibly displaced by conflict or political persecution, but who haven't crossed international borders. And that's not eligible for the legal protections afforded to refugees under international refugee law. But yeah, and I know little of Colombian history aside from broad sketches and the conflict in Colombia is, is something that surely affected many of you and your families. But what I would like to think a little bit about is, is the kind of paradoxical meaning of internal displacement. What does it mean to be displaced within, to be displaced within a space which is supposedly a space of home, of protection? And I, I think we can maybe reflect a bit more of this in the, the discussion to come. Northern Uganda at the time in 2006 was in the final stages of a very brutal decade long civil conflict between the Lord's Resistance Army, a brutal guerrilla group which used child kidnapping as a modus operandi of conflict, and the Ugandan army which embarked in a scourged earth counterinsurgency campaign burning down villages and forcing the majority of the rural population into densely populated displacement camps. At the time, I visited one of the largest camps called Pabo, which had a population of over 50,000 people. It had a main road running through it, which some trucks dared at the time on their way to southern Sudan, and which were filled with small shops, millers of ground rice, a barn which rests Residents could watch uh, Premier League football on a tiny ten of television, a small lodge called the White House where I stayed. Pabo was once uh, a village and market. Now it had become semi-urbanized. I realized speaking to some of the older residents that although they considered themselves internally displaced, um, sorry, that although they considered themselves internally displaced, IDPs as the bureaucratic label would have it, many had never in fact been physically displaced by conflict in the sense, sense of force, rather the world around them was displaced. 
Gone were the fields of millet and rice. Gone were the pathways young lovers would walk together on the way to the market. Gone were the sounds of the dances and funerals throughout the night. In their place came soldiers, curfews, humanitarians with trucks and sacks of white maize, and not the blood brown millet which had been the staple of the Chorley who had lived in the region. Displacement was then not simply a displacement within a, display, a space and a landscape. It was a displacement of the landscape itself. In the conflict's wake, formally ended with a peace treaty in 2006, the state and the UN refugee agencies pressed for the return of IDPs. Um, this politics and policy assumed that it was desirable for those living in displacement camps some for up to two decades to return to their ancestral family land. Now, life in the camps was dire. There were high rates of malnutrition, diseases like cholera, childhood mortality. It was the norm for many of the women I spoke to to have lost a child and dependence on humanitarian aid. So it seemed natural that those living in the camps would want to leave these terrible spaces. But in my research, I found something which contradicted this assumption, at least for some. Among many people living with HIV AIDS and those who are now accessing, accessing antiretroviral treatment, a treatment which requires very rigorous uh, adherence, daily adherence, the preference of many was in fact to remain in the camps. This was in part because they received treatment and food support from the local health clinics and traveling long distances could be prohibitive. But it was also that during the years of displacement, they had formed networks of care, one might say effective networks, which helped sustain them, particularly among women in the camps. To seek treatment in the camps was to disclose one's HIV status. Um, and to, because to seek treatment and food support that was distributed often in public health centers, on particular days, anyone passing by could observe who was receiving it. In fact, the Chorley word for stigma was chimotok, which means to point at someone's back. New identities and biosocialities formed around HIV status. In one camp called a pit where the treatment program had been started by a local Catholic priest, those living with HIV were called the priest's soldiers. Um, the priest soldiers was both, this is a, um, a quote by one Santa Kello who interviewed. So the priest soldiers, it was both in term of stigma, but also adopted by those uh, with HIV themselves as a form of identity. And so to return to family land was now a, a new displacement. Return required re-establishing homesteads that were broken down and clearing fields overgrown with bush, filled with rats and mosquitoes. It required rebuilding broken homes, moving, moving away from the effective networks formed to survive in the camp. Return for women often involved renewed subjection to male control and stigma. And some I found actually moved back to the displacement camps after struggling to return home. So return was not a return to a pre-displacement home, but a new displacement into a wilderness that was once a home. Now, when I began thinking about this class, I was only going to present on my work in South Africa, but these images and thoughts returned to me, even though I have not visited Uganda since 2013. And I wondered why. And I think they've been resurfacing because in a way they speak to the present condition of the pandemic. Most of us are staying and working from home, although the meaning of the word is, of course, very different. But the pandemic has displaced the world around us. Our capacity to visit friends and families, some of which may have been ill, some of which have died during this time. And I've been thinking again about the meaning of displacement. Is it just bodies that are displaced or migration within and across spaces, perhaps across deserts, rivers, seas? Or can places themselves, landscapes and cityscapes be displaced? And what is the process and ethics of writing about displaced worlds and their effects? As I said, I'll come to briefly outline a th theory of effect, but, but the talk I, is really about on the writing process of what it means to be 
attendant to and attentive to the intimate relationships between displaced persons and other uh, migrants and unstable and displaced landscapes. So in order to, to think about these issues, I'm going to read three short excerpts, life narratives have written from three different projects, one from Northern Uganda and two from Johannesburg. And then to return to some reflections about the writing process and ethic theory, theory, also discussing some of the writings of others I find compelling. Just to note that all names and images are used with consent, otherwise I've used pseudonyms for people and for, for one building which is under threat of eviction. So the first uh, piece I'm going to read is from a um, article I published in African Studies um, co sorry, called uh, Diseases Dwelling. And, and I, so that you don't have to take notes, uh, I know some of you are having lunch, I'll share all the, public, the PDFs of all uh, the publications in a uh, folder uh, with, with Juan to, to share with students and anyone who's, who's not a student can just write to me. I'm, I'm happy to share the PDFs also of the books. So this is, this is a, a live narrative of, of one of the women I interviewed um, in, in Uganda called Agnes. In June 2009, I met Agnes in her home village in Ngai and spent the afternoon with the family. I'd met Agnes several times since 2006 in our pit camp. When we met her again, she was sitting uh, in, a, in the family compound with a mother, aunt, and two siblings. There were four in the family that were HIV positive. One of these, her sister Beatrice, was also at home. In the compound was a small cross beneath the palm tree, marking a place where a child had been buried. The family showed me the land. The area was dry and the crops were not doing well, a result of the late rains in 2009. We walked through the spiky bulrushes, millet maize, the weeds clustered above the dry earth. The fingers of millet curled into one another like small fists. Burdened stumps of grass lay where the ground was being prepared. Some trees had been chopped down, though the mango trees and some herbs were left in the fields. Groundnuts grew from the earth with tiny purple flowers between thick leaves of the tigo herb. The family told me there were no longer bad spirits, Jokia. They had been chased away to the swamps with prayer, which involved not only a material, but a spiritual regeneration of the land. Agnes was from the area of Ngai and Oyom. Her history and paths across the region were once shaped by both conflict and illness. She had moved back. Uh, she, she had married and moved to a, a semi-urban area called Minakudu, close to Gulu town, the urban center in the area. However, due to violence and rebel attacks in the area, she and her husband moved back to her family land in Ngai or Yam, where they began falling ill. In Ngai, the rural area, they heard that the health care and medication were available in a pit, and in 2005 decided to move there to get treatment after they tested positive for HIV. So in essence, what they even though this was the tail end of the war for treatment, they in fact moved into the displacement camp rather than the other way around. And I think this reveals some of the, the complex dynamics of mobility around, um, around treatment and in, in, in a kind of post-conflict or period. So Agnes was on the antibiotic septum and had not started antiviral antiretrovirals by the time I met her, but the future prospect of going on to ARVs was central to Agnes's consideration about the future. The decision to move to a pit involved separating from family. In the camp, her husband's alcohol abuse and sm smoking worsened. He had already married a second wife. Though he had tested positive for, for HIV, he refused to start ARVs and died in the camp. Agnes was left without family and the community of those with HIV around her pit, the priest soldiers, formed a nucleus of social life for her in the camp. She always intended to return home to her parents' land. She explained the reasons to me in April 2008 after she had returned. So 
So I'm just looking for the picture. So, so, so the, this is a, a image of a group in the return area. So Agnes said, the reason why I'm staying at my father's land up to now is because I was excluded from my husband's place. From my husband's place, they wouldn't allow me to use the land or allow me to use anything. They never wanted me to stay. My mother-in-law hates me and doesn't want to see me. That's when my father took me away and brought me to stay with him. Even he told me he couldn't see his daughter die. He had to do something before I die. He brought me to the hospital. And up to now, he says that when I'm feeling weak, I can borrow his bicycle and he can bring me to the hospital. So I'm not very badly off. Um, however, when I met her again in August 2008, she'd returned to the camp after having fallen ill. This was the second time she'd returned home and then come back to the camp following the onset of illness. Her parents had been unable to take care of her adequately in the village. Her house in the camp had been destroyed and she was living in the house of another client with HIV. Agnes subsequently returned to the camp again before settling at home in 2009. And so the movement of return was a process of cyclical migration, which home was never fixed. Home itself was in fact these pathways between um, the, the camp and rural areas. In 2007, her sister Beatrice began falling ill. She came to live with Agnes in a pit camp, even though the conflict had ended. Like Agnes, Beatrice's paths were shaped by HIV. Um, she was married and moved to a bulky, but after falling ill, her family fetched her and took her home. Beatrice and her husband lived for a short period in the eye camp. However, after hearing from Agnes about the treatment accessible from her pit, Beatrice moved finally to a pit uh, uh, to stay with Agnes. By 2009, they had moved home and in the village had, had begun to form a support group around them. Uh, with the first support group of HIV AIDS in the area around a local church. In, in essence, they had taken their knowledge of the importance of, of these networks of care back into the rural areas. Both sisters preferred life in their family homestead to the camp where they felt that, stigmatize, but they felt that stigmatization was worse in the rural areas and in the camp, a perception widely reported by other respondents. I attended one of the first meetings of a new village HIV support group uh, that Beatrice and others had arranged. The group had been initiated with, by people with HIV without the help of an external organization. And as I said, this was the first uh, time that this had, had been created and it was an attempt in a sense to, to recreate through the wider areas of, of rural homesteads the type of intimacy and support that had been forged within the difficulties of life in the camp. For Agnes Beatrice and others, navigating the post-conflict landscape was navigating through both the material harshness of the environment, but also landscapes of care. Return was not a return to a pre-displacement order, but rather recreating new paths across the landscape, new connections between the camp and the village, different relations among family. These landscapes were not merely imagined, but were one in which the ill and healing body are materially connected. So the situation of northern Uganda and displacement there might seem very distant from an urban environment and, and the world of inner city Johannesburg. But thinking back where I'm to, I see the connections is precisely in how this navigation across diverse landscapes and the attempt to internalize, to integrate and to, to make sense of, uh, of these diverse landscapes is very central to the, the healing process. It's very central to, to making set, to, to, to the kind of forms of effective healing. So I'm going to speak to a quite different narrative that I, a case study I um, uh, 
documented as part of a, a Max Planck funded project on super diversity and religion in Johannesburg. Um, the narrative is in, in two places, actually, in one, a, a, a book of narrative, long form narrative writing called Writing Invisibility. And the second is a book I co-edited with, with colleagues at, at WITS called Roots and Rights to the City. And it's part of a chapter um, that I co-authored with Eric Warby and Malikius Zulu. And this project focused on, well, my research focused on prophecy in the city and, and what prophecy came to mean for many um, migrants living in Johannesburg. So I'm going to read this narrative of um, one of the prophets that, uh, that uh, we interviewed for the project. And again, even though it seems to jump from Uganda, what I'd like to be attentive to is precisely the way in which the landscape comes to figure, the way in which movement and healing is uh, often not just about the body, but an orientation towards diverse landscapes and an attempt to kind of weave them together in often uh, paradoxical ways. So in the parking lot of the Sundome Casino in Johannesburg, a Zimbabwean security guard started having visions that were to shake his life. They led him to leave his job and embark on a series of wanderings from the back rooms of Berea to the mountains and valleys around Bulawayo. Around him, so he claims, he began to see the possible futures and problems of others. It is fitting that these visions began in a place of gambling, a place of risk and uncertainty, where futures are given over to the vagaries of chance. For many migrants to Johannesburg, the city is a casino of source, sorts, a place of radical risk, where lives themselves are the stakes at play. In recent years, the surfaces of Johannesburg have been pasted over with signs, advertising, and prophecy alongside those for penis enlargement and abortion. Prophets advertise the return of lost lovers, the revelation of one's enemy in the mirror, and healing of all kinds. The signs of proliferation. Matthew. Yeah. Matthew. Yeah. Okay. You, you, you're, you're back again. Good. Good. Can, you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So. The prophet, the historians Dave Anderson and Douglas Johnson write that the prophet is a barometer of social and political behaviors. And I wondered, can these signs pasted across the scarred surfaces of the city, its derelict tenements and trains, traffic like and bridges, tell us something about the social life and politics of the apartheid city? What is meant by prophecy? And do the new prophets speak not only about the city's future, but also about hidden presence and past. So these questions precipitated my own wandering across the city for the research. The research revealed the vast variety of prophecies and settings in which it takes place, from rituals on mountainsides and mine dams, flats and urban slums and sports stadiums to an old synagogue. And now Johannesburg, for those of you who haven't visited, is surrounded by the kind of detritus of apartheid mining capitalism, these acidic waste dumps, and, and even these, this landscape became reinterpreted through these biblical and theological idioms. And across the landscape in Johannesburg, you can see uh, sacred sites demarcated in stones on the landscape. And this is another way in which the, the kind of effective landscape, the way in which the landscape is interpreted is, is not simply the material detritus, but a whole series of idioms and, and visions through which a landscape is interpreted. Um, so I met Prophet Mzalani. Prophet Mzalani is the prophet in this picture. Um, in his flat in Berea, near the long avenue of plane trees that joins Hillbrow to Yeovil, in the lounge, his wife and children sat watching cartoons and television. The walls were adorned with miscellaneous posters, a framed picture of a white mansion, a print of Christ, a calendar from Singapore. Mzalani invited me and my colleague Malika Zulu to sit with him in his consulting room. The room was crowded with medicines in salt and liquid form. 
a few cloths shrouded the windows. On the floor was Mzellani's altar place, with clothes laid on the floor in red, white, and blue, the colors of the French flag, though with its own meaning. White and blue for Zionism, the term used for a very powerful form of uh, in, indigenous churches um, within Southern Africa. Um, and red for his ancestors. Across the cloths lay a knife and a small steel staff. Mzellani city is inhabited by both angels and ancestors. He was a security guard who 15 years ago was shaken by his visions at the casino. His journeyings through the city had, like those of many other migrants, been in one of constant itinerancy, a search for well-being and prosperity. So I'm not going to finish the, the full narrative. I can share those with um, uh, the text if you want to go through the, the full text. But what is important about this narrative is that the dimension of prophecy involved very much returning home to Zimbabwe, of, of, of returning with the kind of spiritual learnings of Zimbabwe, which were then shared with other migrants in the, the city in order to survive. Um, and so the cyclical patterns of migration, of, of, of moving between Johannesburg and um, a kind of ancestral spiritual homeland in Zimbabwe were very much necessary for um, his own kind of initiation as, as a healer. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm going to move on to, because we were short of time, to, to, to my core study uh, that I've been undertaking in the last uh, over the last decade on uh, and lawful occupations in Johannesburg. What is very significant, I think, in, in thinking about the city is, is that the city is never just a physical infrastructure. The city is, is also these kind of layers and orientations towards and elsewhere. So uh, within the journeys of migration, and I think this is important for the kind of writing process, um, there's a kind of disorientation and, and a kind of, in order to survive, um, migrants often reorient within the city. They find their own forms of support and navigation in the city, but are also oriented back towards distant, uh, um, distant lands, imagined spaces, um, networks that, that cross frontiers and borders. And, 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 and the city is really this kind of densification of these layered landscapes. And in the writing process, I, I think it's, it's, it's challenging, but, but part of the process is trying to, to understand the kind of orientations towards space, both the immediate space of the city and the field work, and potentially um, more distant spaces. So I'm going to move on now to a, uh, a piece a section of a um, book chapter I wrote uh, for this volume. It's open access to uh, a volume that actually stemmed from um, a conference in Berlin with, with colleagues, in, including hans jürgen Dilge at Freya Universität in Berlin in 2015. And, and we uh, um, co-edited with Marianne Burchart um, and Astrid Boschow. Okay. So this, uh, I'm just going to read a section. And this really, for those interested in effect, the, the introduction provides a kind of deep uh, theorization of the, the kind of relationship between effect and emotion. Um, but, but before I get on to, to the narrative from that, I wanted to just provide a brief context. Johannesburg is often considered a city of migrants and within South Africa, inner city Johannesburg is, has, I think, the highest density of uh, both cross-border migrants, but also migration from other rural areas of South Africa. And, 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 and these patterns of migration, of course, are, are nothing new. They're, they're embedded in long-term histories of mining within Johannesburg and the exploitation of 
of black labor, not just within South Africa, but, but from across the region. And so these patterns of, 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 of migration and exploitation of labor within Johannesburg very much form part of the, the city's landscape. Along with this has come a kind of paradoxical um, movement, not really, of from the early outset of, of policing and controlling uh, working class black, black populations within the inner city. And, and the history of Johannesburg is, is a history of successive displacements of, of working class black populations, ones that have continued into the, the post-apartheid era. And again, this is important when thinking about migration and displacement, that often the initial displacement of, of being forced to move from one's own country, whether for um, due to political persecution or due to economic reasons, and, and of course, I'm sure, as many of you have studied in, in the course, the boundaries between an asylum seeker and refugee are often bureaucratic rather than meaningful. Uh, in a kind of social and existential sense. Um, and so in the post-apartheid era, era, particularly with the, the political turmoil um, in uh, Zimbabwe, as, as well as further afield in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, one had an intensification of cross-border cross, cross migration, as well as Black South Africans reclaiming the inner city spaces as, as a space of work and residency. But this, again, went alongside very intense forms of uh, further displacement, which is eviction. And, and a lot of my work over the last um, decade or so has been documenting eviction, as you see, often with the complicity of police and the state. Um, many migrants, not just migrants, but also uh, not just cross-border migrants, but low-income South Africans, who um, couldn't afford accommodation in the inner city, um, moved into unlawful occupations, often called by the media and city planners as, as hijacked buildings, but, but, but only sometimes are they kind of taking control of criminal gangs. Often they are, are slowly occupied um, uh, by low-income workers and traders who, who can't afford rentals in the city. These spaces have, have been more or less abandoned by the state and often are in very extreme cases of dereliction. Fires are frequent and each year there's death by fire. Um, sometimes there are building collapses. This is one which collapsed after a fire. There's lack of water and sanitation, um, often very derelict infrastructures. This was a building in, called dark city and the buildings often um, referred to as informally as Nyamandao, which means dark place. And, and darkness in this sense has a very powerful effective force because in in Southern African languages, in this Nbele, Nisizulu, um, Unyama or Isinyama can also refer to misfortune in, in, in a similar way that that sometimes darkness is used at, in an effective way in, in English. And of course, within colonial histories, this is a very problematic uh, um, histories of the associations of, of darkness with Africa and historical lack. But, but the term in Yamandao is, is often used in the inner city itself. And again, these are spaces which are, are highly precarious, but again, um, are spaces of intimacy, of family, of, uh, of, of, of migrants, both from um, abroad and within South Africa, forming effective relationships within the city, but often being displaced again through eviction. And so you have these kind of cycles of eviction, along with exposure to, to xenophobic violence, um, and so on, many also disabled and blind migrants live in the cities. So I'm going to, going to speak to one a case study. It's in the chapter um, uh, in the book, um, Effective tra tra Trajectories. Before I, 
I speak, I just wanted to point out that that Johannesburg is the city I was born and, and grew up. And my own relationship in the research process is very complex as, as a white South African and, and with the research takes place within a landscape formed by by white violence and within South Africa also by male violence and, and the kind of violence of patriarchy. And so as a researcher, one never comes neutrally into a space. You enter a space which is already um, scarred with with violence. And it, it, in my case, with the ancestry of white violence. And so you, the research process is a complex navigation. And again, politically, I can't claim to represent in a way the residents of of and lawful occupations or dark buildings, the process of documentation is, in a sense, a tenuous one, a, a fragile one of, of making friendships, alliances, of, in a very precarious way, trying to kind of reconstitute lost worlds and lost landscapes and being attentive to, to the violence of the land, to the violence of the city and the way in which that violence leaves its traces. And the um, it also, and this is where I speak about disorientation on behalf of the writer, that engagement is profoundly disorienting for oneself. And I think if, if one takes a research and writing process seriously in an attempt to not to understand fully the effective worlds of others, but to be kind of oriented towards their landscapes, it, it requires a kind of desubjectivization and openness to to another mode of being in the city. And, and so the city I inhabit after 10 years of the research, the, the things I notice and I'm pointed towards are, are completely different from uh, how I would have viewed and moved through the city 10 years ago. Um, so I'm going to now move on to a, um, uh, one of the case studies in one of these unlawfully occu occupations. The, the occupation is still occupied, so it's, a pseudonym is used um, for the, both the building and, and those involved. So this is the station, and, and, uh, and you can see the interior of the building. It's, it's, it's a kind of informal settlement with built or thin an inner city tenement. A few bricks lie on the pavement outside a dirty brown warehouse, beside a corrugated iron garage door and the white stripes of burglar bars. It is October 2014. The warehouse borders Jeppe Police Station, the main police station in the area, which became a site of refuge after the anti-immigrant violence of 2008, and is who, who and in whose basement migrants are now regu regularly confined awaiting deportation. A little down the road, Albert Tinas' Sulu Avenue is the zebra bar adorned with the stuffed heads of animals. Across the street, the facade of a building adorned in multicolored letters advertising the city as one of the new urban renewal projects, Mabaneng, or Place of Light, a place of galleries, coffee shops, and loft conversions. Pedestrians pass the bricks, hardly noticing them. The bricks seem like the rubble left over by construction workers. But if one looks more closely, one can see the brown stains that mark the paving and tar around them, like the contours of lakes on a concrete grid. Those who pass the bricks do not even look at them as they walk by on their way to work or in search of work to the police station or home. The violence these bricks memorializes is almost entirely erased. They are like the lives they mark, the banal leftovers of ceaseless demolition and reconstruction. The murder took place only days earlier at the site marked by the bricks. A young man I shall call David had been collecting beers with a friend for his mother Rosemary's Shabin, an illegal bar in the station. When they um, uh, had been collecting beers when he was attacked and shot. Mourning for the young man in the building um, had gone on all week. I went one night with a local bishop to Rosemary's room and, and I'd known her before. 
and and the the murdered boy um um and when I visited, I was struck by the intensity of grief, by the proximity of bodies and voices, by songs and alcohol, by the uncontainable energy of loss and grief that seemed to take place, uh, to take people to a precipice of near madness. Rosemary, who had not seen since the murder, sat in the corner of room, surrounded by women, lost in her grief, as the bishop said prayers for a murdered son. A few days later, a large crowd gathered at the site of the strewn bricks, and you can see this is the image of it. They came along with the young man's body, which was being carried in a coffin at the back of the Toyota Hilux, serving as a hearse for the King and Queen's funeral parlor, where a non-dominational Christian service had been held. The van had stopped at the station where David's clothes were collected. Rosemary sat in the back of the van, her face contorted by grief. After the ceremony, the group collected clothes and dust from Rosemary's room before moving to the site of the murder. David's cousin, dressed in a gray suit, prayed and cleaned the, the tar at the site of the murder um, with a brush made of grass thatch while the crowd sang. He collected the blood-stained dirt from the site and placed it with the body. It was an act of cleansing, of calling the spirit from the site of death to travel with the body on the long journey back to Zimbabwe, to his ancestral home. If these rites are not performed, the spirit can remain unsettled, itinerant, causing misfortune to strangers and kin alike. A year after the murder, when a memorial service was once again held in Rosemary's room, Rosemary and her partner for rice had still not learned of any developments in the case, and the murder file was being archived. They decided to do something they had been considering for a while, which was to save money for traditional healing in Zimbabwe, who could tell who David's murderers were. Rosemary had already visited the healer once, and he had told her that members of David's family on the paternal side were responsible for the murder through witchcraft. But they told me that they wanted to know who pulled the trigger. For I explained that since the police had failed, their only recourse left, this was their only recourse left for the investigation. Although they never managed to pay the full amount to find out who the actual murderer was. Rosemary told me that every time she had to walk past the site of the murderer, bad memories returned. More than a year later, I visited the site of her son's burial at a rural homestead in Gutu, Zimbabwe. The homestead consisted of a few clay and brick houses far off the road. It was surrounded by red wild grasses and gardens of okra, sun-stunted maize, beans and pumpkins. Rosemary's son had been buried in a mound beneath a leafless wild peach tree along with his aunt who had died of AIDS and his grandfather. Rosemary had returned to the site to arrange for cement and bricks to be put over the grave. She knelt beside the grave and wailed with pain, her voice emanating from a frail, frail frame, her dreadlocks hanging over her face. Afterwards, she told me that it was healing to visit the grave and that her son must know she was there. She would arrange for the elders and counselors of the village to be there for the burial. The effective force of loss, grief, and memory is something felt as deep and overwhelming pain and stress. Rosemary smoked marijuana heavily to calm her stress, but the effect of loss is also something that overflows interiority, overflows borders, and is intensified in certain sites. The room in which the loved one lived, the site of the murder, the ancestral home. So I think that for me was among the most difficult uh, pieces to, to, to write and, and also ethically, how does one write about the loss and trauma of another? And in doing so, I, I in fact didn't speak to, to Rosemary about the murder unless she spoke for at least a year after, after the, the death. And, and in doing so, as a writer, I cannot place myself or even imagine uh, her pain or the pain of a of um, a mother losing her only child. And, and so the writing process then was also 
about how the grief and the loss has reoriented Rosemary within the city, but also to her homeland. And, and in the book I'm writing, I give the long narrative, but that rural area that I documented wasn't a source of home or happiness for Rosemary. It was her husband's uh, uh, family land in which she was treated very badly, but that the body returned there reoriented her to that rural landscape in Zimbabwe where she had memories of, of, of raising her young, young son. But that reorientation wasn't the process of, again, returning back to home, but, but of forming new connections, in this case, the relationship with loss. And in writing this, as you know, it, and, and this is uh, something we can discuss, you know, one of the ways in which I wrote was to be very attentive to these landscapes, to the cityscape, to the remembered landscape. Uh, and often the questions weren't about loss, but about the games that were played in that landscape, the pathways that were, were taken. So uh, with these, I'm going to speak briefly uh, um, about just ideas of effect. Um, I'm not going to give a full, there are plenty of books and volumes outlining this. And as I said, I refer you to the, to our introduction and effective trajectories for some of the outline of the literature. I'm just going to speak briefly to, to, to a bit of how I understand effect and, and how I think effect designates this intimate relationship between self and world and the relationships of care. And I think that can be a valuable lens. There are many others and, and, and this is just one that I've taken. So as Spinoza has framed it, and a lot of contemporary affect theory arises from Spinoza, the human body can be affected in many ways, whereby its power of activity is increased or diminished. And where I think the, the, the simplicity of Spinoza's definition um, still has power is that affect is, it doesn't draw a clean distinction between emotion and action. One is affected in the way a landscape or a political event impacts on the body, impacts on one's emotional world, but in turn one also affects the landscape, one moves through it, one recreates it. And, and so it captures in a sense this intimate relationship, I think, between these wider scale political processes and internal worlds, which, which doesn't rely on a kind of psychological or psychoanalytic analysis of the self. But one thing important is that um, the process, as we've seen both in the case study of Northern Uganda and of Johannesburg, is not of encountering a stable landscape, but a landscape itself that is under transformation. And this is a form of navigation, as Vig has argued. Social navigation requires establishing subjective coordinates within a landscape that is itself in motion. Um, and an effective approach indicates the relationship between an uh, embodied experience and a terrain subject to collapse, instability, and dislocation, as well as the potentiality for new forms of, of subjectivity and social relations. So effects in both corporeal orientations and webs of uncertain relationships and unstable infrastructures and forms of temporal experiences generate and open up. These orientations encompass coordinates near and far, mundane and ancestral, religious and infrastructural, and relations both with the living and the dead. Um, Berberich and Campbell have explored the way in which affects can be understood relationally in what they term effective landscape. And the definition they propose for effective landscapes is to consider space and place beyond their material properties while realizing that this beyond of imaginary places, ideals, and real but intangible objects underpin and produce material spaces and social spaces too. So again, the writing process involves this attentiveness to both the scene, the material context, which one documents through art or ethnography or whatever your research method be, 
but also an attentiveness to the traces on the landscape of past violence, of past joy, and also of uh, these kind of imagined landscapes that exist within a space. Um, so what I've, I've spoken a lot about, in a sense, uh, the process of, 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 of healing and, and movement and displacement, but I think some of this, including in my own work, still has a tendency to, to emphasize these dynamics of, of trauma and loss and displacement. And of course, these are, are very real, um, but I think it's also important to, to speak to in, in, in a way in which these overlaid landscapes are also generative, are also generative of forms of, of, of creativity, of art, of social production. And, and so I'm going to speak just briefly about, um, um, sorry, I need about the work of um, my wife, Adriana Miranda da Cunha, who's a Brazilian arts, arts educator and had also been uh, uh, conducting work at an inner city theater in, uh, in Johannesburg called Hilbrow Theater. And Adriana and I live again between two countries, and so our own experience of research is this process of cross interpretation. And so her experience of Johannesburg was mediated through being a Brazilian, and 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 so that I think sometimes someone coming from a distant landscape illum can illuminate elements of of a space that remain hidden in everyday life. So her work was on uh, uh, called Hilbrow Theatre, which is beside an old Lutheran church in um, inner city Johannesburg. Um, and she, she wrote about uh, a theatre project um, uh, for particularly for, t for adolescent girls um, with, within the theatre. Um, so she writes, Adriana writes of what she terms the, a, a transversal aesthetic, a form of aesthetic that emerges precisely in the interactions between landscapes, between mobilities. And she writes, um, the mobility between the countryside and the city evokes a transversal aesthetic, an aesthetic in the case of theater, which combines contradictory and antagonistic qualities evident in the group which form uh, a collective recognition. In the case of adolescence in Hillbrow Theatre, that overlay of dislocation and orientation um, produces a particular aesthetic which seems to en encompass the gaps and contradictions of these diverse worlds. And in the same way, and I know some of you are artists, the same way one, one can think of healing um, in the case of Mzalani as intent in a way to integrate the discordance between diverse landscapes and world, I think art and, and theater production can serve much the same function. And, and in my own writing processes, I, I think draw a lot from literature, from uh, fiction too, and not just from anthropology. Um, I'd, I'd wanted to, to speak a bit about the writing of others, but, but we started late and, and time is short. So I'm just gonna signal two writers who I think that students um, should really um, look at um, in, in terms of uh, thinking about writing migration. The one is a, a colleague at mine um, at WITS, although she also um, is involved in a number of other universities, including Oxford, Caroline Wanjiku Kohatu, who has this fantastic book, um, The Migrant Woman of, of Johannesburg, which I encourage many of you to to, to read and which has influenced um, also my own work. Um, and, and, and Caroline writes of the in-between spaces and documents the experience of women migrants in Johannesburg as existing in these in-between landscapes. Um, in that uh, edited edition we wrote, uh, writing um, Invisibility, um, Caroline also has a beautiful piece on on called the bookseller of Kibera. I wanted to discuss, but but we don't have time. Another writer I really recommend is 
uh, the work of Valeria Luaselli, who has two, I think, quite extraordinary books. Uh, one, which is a um, nonfiction narrative book. Luaselli is a, a Mexican writer based in the US of her work as a court translator for children in, a, in an um, immigration court in New York and about the, the kind of bureaucratic processes involved in documenting migrant stories. And th this is very important because often when one documents the stories of, of asylum seekers or those seeking asylum, there's no pure story. These stories have been cultivated in relationship to a series of bureaucratic institutions because a, the way a story is told can be the difference between getting uh, asylum or being deported. And so narrative has a particular power. And, and so when one is doing research, one is writing within um, narratives already established by, by these forms of power. And I think Lucille very much documents the relationship between documenting um, the stories of, of, of migrants within the US and, and the, the kind of bureaucratic apparatus involved. She also has another book, which is a fictional um, book, uh, but draws in, in a sense, the same experiences called The Lost Children Archive, um, which is partly set as a kind of journey in the deserts of Arizona and again deals with, with un, undocumented migration and these journeys across the desert. And which also very much, I can't go into too much now, but explores the kind of the way the landscape is is a form of orientation between writer and subject and and how maybe the the stories of of uh, migrants and the displaced can't be accessed directly, the internal worlds. But what is perhaps possible is a kind of mutual orientation. So in the story, the the narrator's own children, also become lost in the desert and they meet um, uh, two, two undocumented girls crossing the desert. And that meeting, it could, um, it's not simply a, a kind of sentimental allegory like, oh, well, uh, just imagine yourself in the place of the other. I think in many ways that's not possible, at least for me, to just imagine oneself in the place of other. But what happens is then, to try in the research and, and writing process to, to find a meeting point, a crossing point, a point where those, our interlocutors can orient oneself towards landscapes they loved, they shared, they imagined, their futures. And I think the kind of sensitivity of the writing process is trying in a way to, to kind of reconstruct and, and to find form within these overlaid and very fragile landscapes of displacement and 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 to be attentive again that it's not just people that are displaced but but also worlds um so i'm going to leave it there and we can hopefully open up for discussion i'd be fascinated to hear about your own projects and and your own thoughts also drawing from colombia and berlin and elsewhere um thank you thank you thank you very much matthew Really, really was a great. Um, I mean, I, I just want to jump in to ask you something. No, uh, we, we leave the space to for other people and all that. But really, I was struck. And I really like your very detailed, ethnographic, multi-layered, you no know, description. No, you were writing. I mean, you were, you were the way you, the, the way you write, the way you speak. No. Uh, more or less, you were taking us to try to conduct yourself to those to that meeting point, as, as you said at the end. No. In Latin America, at least, the 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 the, the classical question will be this one. No. When 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 you give give this talk, someone in the auditorium will always have this question. No. What about the political? No. Uh, you didn't mention the word resistance. No. Which for for that person in the auditorium will be the no way in thinking of the political no, uh, trying to say okay well Matthew great great uh, is not sentimental this is a meeting point but what about the political no, no, 
And I want to ask you, Prashali, because, because I know that you work a lot with the Pobinetis book that I really, really like, you know, the one about the economies of, of abandonment, you know, and the way that she gave it this peripheral concept called the perdurance, you no, know, which goes back, back, back again to, to Spinoza and the way of Conatus and all that, you no. Know? And I just want to, 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 to ask you to say something about how do you, why don't, why don't you translate this, this meeting point into, into the world resistance? Why do you, why do you, why do you do not want to go there? So if, if we start from that, 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 that would be okay. Yeah, I mean, that's a great oh, place. Wait, sorry, <laughs> I, I have here a... the, the Richelieu book in Spanish. <laughs> uh, cool. well, I mean, that's yeah. a great question. And, and. A whole array of my work has been about legal cases. I do work with um, a, a social movement called the Inner City Federation, which does work against evictions, um, against a, um, a, you know, for basic rights in the city, you know, and, and so I've written a lot around that politics too. I think I shared with one and, and can share others a, a piece called The City Otherwise. I just couldn't cover that. I've already covered perhaps too much in this lecture and, and I want to do focus. But, but I think it's a really key domain and I, I do think it's a domain where affect theory can be valuable um, mm. because I think, well, what is the political? And, and I know often, uh, say I, I did some research in, not really research, but I visited some occupations in Sao Paulo, for instance. And, and you know, in Brazil, there's a very powerfully organized landless workers movement, housing movement, and uh, MS-10, and in the cities, MTS-10, and, and you know, the, the occupations in Sao Paulo, for instance, are, are very much organized around resistance, around mm -hmm. housing rights, and so on. Um, in Johannesburg, this just wasn't the case, mm -hmm. at least mm -hmm. until 2015, that most of the, the um, or the uh, uh, sorry, the occupations and the spaces where, say, Rosemary lived. In fact, people wanted to evade politics in the state. Many were fleeing. Again, uh, this wasn't really in this narrative, but Rosemary was also involved in uh, and others in the building in political work in Zimbabwe, and so they're fleeing from political persecution. And so politics very much goes around, but there's an attempt to and and. When Jiku Kohatu writes about this well, an attempt to evade the state, but this evasion, just because it doesn't form the kind of idiom of, um, of political, like a formalized political party mm -hmm. or social movement, doesn't mean it's not political. That's what the very fact of just, and, and this is where Pavanelli's work comes in and her notion of the otherwise, which I elaborate on elsewhere, is, is precisely that to live otherwise within the city is to, to live politically. Um, mm -hmm. To simply endure what Pavanelli says, the gale, the, you know, these gale force winds of neoliberalism, it's political. So say in this occupation of, of Rosemary and others, they might not be involved. In fact, they aren't in a formal civic movement, right? But they are, the very fact that as undocumented migrants, they managed they did in fact wage a legal case against eviction to live in that space for 10 years uh, as undocumented migrants, mm -hmm. subject to, to continual deportations, police harassment, endless police uh, raids and campaigns, uh, um, and, and still somehow survive and endure. And, and this is, I think, Pavanelli also writes about affect as endurance. Simply the mm -hmm. capacity to endure and to remain mm -hmm. is a political act even if it's not, uh, but in more recently, since 2015, there's a group that's developed called the Inner City Federation, um, which is more overtly political in the model of a kind of social movement that campaigns, that advocates, that protests and so on. And so from these spaces, the, there is this, this focus on resistance, uh, which is emerging. But, but what I want to get at, in this is is that um, is not to always. I think a problem with say a lot of urban theory is to often assume that politics must be about this formal political mobilization against mm -hmm. neoliberalism, against eviction, and all of those things. And this is really important. I'm not denying that. But often, just empirically, this isn't what what happens. That 
that people find more subtle ways to navigate their terrain, you know, and, yeah. Yeah. and in Uganda itself, you know, I mean, the, those in the displacement camps were, were caught between two forces, this very violent uh, uh, Lord's Resistance Army rebel group led by Joseph Kony, who mm. was supposed to be a spiritual healer, but very, very brutal, but also very brutal counterinsurgency in which the um, uh, Museveni, who's very dictatorial for those of you who follow Ugandan politics, the North was not his support base. The, mm -hmm. the North were his traditional enemies, and so the state and the army were as violent, uh, you know, to the displa displacing and, and internationally, I mean, this was, you know, there was a huge outcry against Pony and the Lord's Resistance Army, but, but often the state was as violent and the army was as violent. And so those in the camps, in fact, couldn't be political because to have any resistance to the state was to be associated with the rebels, the Lord's mm -hmm. Resistance Army, and yet the state was abandoning and persecuting them. And so they, to survive it in, in, in it, it required these forms of evasion, these forms of just navigating and, and enduring. And I think this is really a, a feature of, of undocumented migration all over the world where, look, I mean, there, there are, of course, undocumented migrant movements. I know in Berlin, for instance, there were movements of occupations of undocumented, uh, um, undocumented migrants. I forget the name of the square, um, Paris, Brussels, they're the Saint Papier movements. So there are these movements, but but again, I think this is where the kind of research process comes in. Mm -hmm. The empirical process is to to try and understand well what is happening. How are these wider mm -hmm. processes impacting, debilitating the individual? And and again, to come back to that idea of Spinoza's ethic being the the debilitation of the capacity to act. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. the political situations are so extreme, people can't act. All they can do is endure yeah. and survive, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much. Anyone wants to jump in? Alex, are you there? Okay. Okay. Go. Go. Should I? Yeah. Yes. Um, so um, I, I could just follow up. I, I was thinking, in, I, I had a similar question, or maybe slightly differently put, because in our class we we use the term, the the concept, the notion of agency quite a lot to kind of counter um, forms of objectification or escape the trap of objectification, of of reification, of uh, sort of and 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 the notion of agency seems to be productive be a productive one because it allows for an idea of of um political forms or forms of action that can also be read in political ways but that are clearly not um necessarily connected to institutionalized forms of political politic politicization as in the way that you mentioned it so i was wondering if these concepts of of agency, um, I was thinking about them earlier when you spoke about the generative acts, creativity, healing, and so on. So I was wondering if the concept of of agency, ideas of agency, are are relevant for your thinking. And by the way, thank you. It was a very inspiring and thought provoking presentation. Thank you very much. Also, the <clears throat> the visual material that you shared was very um, compelling and interesting. And so Shane, I mean, I don't, I don't use, you know, of course, these debates are very old in social theory, you know, Giddens and Bourdieu and structure, structuration and agency and so on. And, and so I don't engage it, not because not important, just I don't think I have a whole lot to say about it. I mean, I think that, that of course, um, that uh, the displaced migrants do express agency uh, in in recreating the city, in forming pathways through the, the city, in in these kind of patterning networks. You know, often that agency is very constrained by uh, by very extremely powerful and debilitating forces. Um, so I mean, I, I didn't really go into this, but like. Part of my, uh, you know, again, to come back to, you know, in that, that chapter, I speak about the concept of effective regenerations and often the agency expressed in response to say eviction 
and uh, urban dislocation doesn't take the domain of of like large scale political action the agency is precisely effective the capacity to to to, to renew social life to renew social relationships mm. to heal of from loss is is an expression of agency because it's not easy you know and and often you know the rates of violence addiction and so on you know of course we know this from latin america too you know and brazil the favelas you know um, so I, I think, of, of course, there is the agency of, of, of migrants and, uh, you know, I'm very much against this, uh, you know, these kind of bureaucratic regimes, which not against, but one has to be really sensitive to the way in which, uh, you know, humanitarian agencies and so on label, you know, IDP is, you know, IDP, refugee asylum seeker, you know, you know, these labelings of, of who people are often bear very little mm. um, meaning on the ground. I mean, in, in South Africa, the distinction between a, a refugee and undocumented, well, it's a legal distinction. The one confers right, but experientially, it's, it's very, it's not really meaningful at all for many people, because if you're leaving a space in which there's drought and widespread political turmoil, but you haven't been part of a political party, well, you know, uh, you know, what is the distinction in experience? So I think it comes back to your question of like, yes, we have to be attentive very much to to the ways in which individuals, migrants and documented ourselves navigate um, the, the constraints in um, within political circumstances, but, but we shouldn't necessarily have a like a, a predisposition of of what political agency means um so i'll leave it there but i'd, I'd be interested in, in your work too and what your students have to have to say you know and i'm happy with anyone to to disagree or critique me you know hey marion marion please go Yeah, thank you, Matthew, so much for this really, really interesting um, talk. Um, I think it's super, super relevant for many of our students who have been posing questions of posi positionality and of um, representation and struggling with these problems of representation. And um, and you have um, you have really impressively shown them ways of um, of narrat narrating. Um, uh, um empirical findings and um and uh and but i'm wondering about one thing in um so you're writing about landscapes relationships building relationships um um but you are using the i yeah the, the pronoun i so you have so that you ha and you have a very strong voice and this question of voice when like writing about migration or talking about migration um do you see yourself more as a writer who has a super individualized voice um or because you also said at the beginning that you would not um root um your talk in a theory um or is it more like connected to an anthropolo um, uh, anthropological theory. I'm wondering, like, how, how can we help students to find their voices? Well, I think, I mean, that's a great question and something, you know, I teach the writing course, but it's something which is very hard, hard for oneself and hard for, but voice doesn't begin when you write. Voice begins the minute you look, you know, and what you look at. What voice begins the minute you take out your notebook and start taking, you know, a note because what you see is is the beginning of your voice as as a writer. And you know, I'm inspired by a lot of of literature and and fictional techniques, but but also an empiricist. You know, I think when one writes, given the amount of misinformation around. Uh, migration, moral panic. As a writer writing about these, one has to be really attentive to getting your facts right, to getting the details right, to understanding 
the limitations of statistics and so on. But nonetheless, I think, you know, there's a Nobel Prize winner, Kazuo Ishiguro, who I saw talk many years ago, and he speaks of the writing processes as a kind of hinterland between self and other. When you find your voice, it's often not the voice that you began with. You know, if I'm just me writing my personal expression, that's not, you know, voices, the writing process is often being inhabited by the, the voices of, of others. And, and, and this is tough, you know, I mean, for students who think that you just go and you speak to people and, you know, you hear these kind of uh, traumatic events, it doesn't affect you, it, it does. Of course, nothing like the impacts of those around, but, but it can affect your dreams. It affects, you know, voices, images stay with you for years. And, and in a sense, the writing process is about articulating a voice which is neither just personal expression nor entirely the voice of the other, but which is something kind of in between. And, but to say that I'm attentive to, I mean, where I can, of course, you can't do this with everybody and not in the space of a master's, but you know, the, the people I do research with, I've known some of them for, t for 10 years, you know, some people in Uganda I still call now. And I always take the text back as much as I can, not always, but, but where possible, I take the text back and I go closely back over the text with them to see is this both accurate factually, but does this in a way genuinely represent your story or do I, do I feel that you've, you've misrepre I've misrepresented this, this somehow? And I think that process of taking the text back to those you speak to can be very valuable in, um, you know, in producing narratives. I mean, of course, there, there are participatory methods and so on, which I think are really valuable, you know, I, but when it has to be, again, it comes back to this notion of, of, uh, of, you know, that stories have been cultivated over, over time, you know, the stories have been, so often if you do a kind of participatory group, people will repeat the same stories that they've had to tell the UNHCR or the asylum office and so on, because they know that those stories are powerful. And the UN will not ask somebody, well, what fruit trees grew in your childhood garden? What songs or games did you play as a child? Um, what books did you read? You know, these are things which, which give a meaning to, to people's lives. And, and I think a skilled interviewer is about being attentive and I think Luiselli is great at this, of being attentive to, to these moments, stories, memories, which are not captured in, in that kind of bureaucratized uh, um, landscape. And again, one final thing, I've mentioned this, but as a white writer, you are writing from a place of violence. And that's it, you know, you, and unless white writers wrestle with the fact that whiteness is a form of violence and is associated with violence, then you are, you know, we can be caught in our kind of liberal illusions, but, but, you know, and this is something I wrestle with, you know, like, should I even be in these spaces documenting? But at the same time, the violence of apartheid and post-apartheid is precisely these stories just not being told. You know, the, this, this kind of celebration of, of urban renewal and so on, and just a kind of blindness to violence. So there's, well, one has a choice between the inherent violence of the research process, which one can try to deal with, but also the violence of blindness, the violence of turning away and just not engaging with the spaces we are, you know? And, and uh, you know, I think this, you know, this is something students have to wrestle with for themselves and there's no answer, there's no, uh, this is the way to do it. It's it's the it's an ethical question that has to be posed, uh, you know, in the writing process. And I think, you know, discussions within peer groups, uh, you know, workshops, and so help you know to, to help people formulate these these questions. Thank you, Matthew. I I have another follow up question, but I would leave the time now for the students to ask. Uh, anyone? <laughs> They're shy. <laughs> 
So uh, maybe I just say one thing in terms of looking at, at texts and how to do this stylistically is sometimes, you know, the, uh, you know, I mean, one of the biggest influences of me, but also one of the greatest writers of the, you know, 20th century is, is W.G. Zabold, I think, you know, his books, Austerlitz and the Emigrants. And and Zabel's technique of writing violence is is to to allude to it. Sometimes, you know, like he writes a whole book, Auschwitz, which constantly alludes to Auschwitz, but it's never mentioned. Everything is about alluding. And sometimes there's a narrative technique of all the violence which one one can't represent. The only stylistic technique is to allude to them or, or to find other ways. And maybe art and and fiction in some ways allows the space to access certain things which one can't in a kind of realist empirical mode. So, I mean, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, that's for me a kind of close reading of Zebold's text is also valuable in seeing how mm -hmm. how those violent and, and his use of landscape, in fact, as the main narrative device, I think is very interesting to, to look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pamela has a question. Pamela? Pamela. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Matthew. That was a beautiful talk. Um, I wanted to to have you ask your question to follow up on your, your sort of beautiful ending about displacement, not of the individual, but of the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I sort of made me contemplate think that maybe you were trying to suggest that the affective is a way to access that world that that in, individual encompasses in some way, including the politics, including the agency. And I wanted you to just to sort of maybe reflect on that a little bit more, because I, I feel like that that affect is trying to encompass so many things. And I think that idea of agency and resistance in the world is all encompassed in that. And I loved the way that that phrase of the, the displacement and what it means to think about sort of displacement as worldly, but encompassed in the individual. So maybe if you could say more on that and how affect theory plays into it. Yeah, I mean, I think the kind of relational dimension of, of affect theory is very important, you know, and, you know, the that affect as one is affected by a landscape and affect that space. It, it's a material space too, but but it's also a lost space often. And this is the experience of displacement is is one of loss. You know, because one can't return to what is left behind. And as I said, that experience of so one is oriented towards an imagined future, a lost past, but also the kind of material domains. And those material domains, if one gets into forms of religion and ontology and so on, are not fixed by the physical infrastructures. These are important. You know, if your roof is leaking rain, this is, has, is a very material effect on your body, you know, but 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 that material effect on your body is not the only way in which you engage with the world around. One engages with this kind of overlay of landscapes where a, a landscape is a material space, a lost space, and an emergent space altogether. And I think in, in some ways textual traditions can grasp that or forms of narrative writing can grasp that in a way which is closer to the experience than, say, film, because I think film, you know, you use a collage or pastiche, it often comes across as kind of kitsch, whereas I think that, and so it comes back to, you know, and the writers I've mentioned are, are far more skilled than me, you know, it's something that, I, you know, I'm still learning a lot about myself, you know, and, but how do you get this kind of overlay of, within a text of different temporalities? the present but also these kind of layers of, of past and future which which exist and, and theoretically i think affect points to that because mm -hmm. i think affect theoretically is is precisely this uh, embodied relationship to a landscape but mm -hmm. but also a, an orient you know like sarah ahmed's work for instance and orientation is very important you know that to desire is not just to desire like some internal psychological psychoanalytic thing. To desire is to be oriented towards an object of desire, uh, even if that object is impossible. And, and, and so I think affect theory 
you know, and and the idea of orientation of looking towards and pointing towards, I think, is can be very powerful in, in grasping these dynamics. And again, in grasping the politics, not necessarily of these, you know, I mean, this again, I think Juan mentioned was a legitimate critique of my talk, and I could have elaborated more, but but not in politics is necessarily these wide scale economic, political, social mm. processes, but how those wide scale processes impact on the body, impact on mm. its capacity to orient within the world. Mm. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. Anyone wants? Uh, I see Blake. Blake sent uh, a question through the chat. Blake, perhaps you want to to talk, or you or or you with your son. <laughs> Hi, Blake. <laughs> uh, Matt, uh, can you see the chat? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Blake sent. So I'm just going to, um, uh, okay. So, so Blake is, is uh, a PhD student of mine and Lorena Nunes is doing very interesting work on comparison between the Mexican and Arizona or borderlands and, and Zimbabwe and South Africa. So, uh, so I think I would be interested to, to hear in building on the chat and the conception of agency and how you approach political subversion or effective subversion in countering forces on unevenness. Would this be theatrically expressed or underscored by what you conceptualize of, as effective regeneration, which would suggest that a methodological idea is at least partially developed or settled upon in the research and narrative writing process? Um, so, I mean, that's a very complex question and mm. I, I don't fully grasp it. So I, and I know you're with your, 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 your son, but I think it again speaks back to the um, notion of what, uh, you know, of what it means both politically, but aesthetically that effective dimension and and I think again, like Juan said, like I think Pavanelli provides a route to to understand affect politically, which is that the the subversion to live otherwise is is a form of subversion to endure, to feel otherwise, to desire otherwise, in a way that subverts, you know, the hegemonic forms of politics is. Uh, I think that is a form of effective subversion and. Uh, I, th I think aesthetically, you know, I, I spoke about that Diana's work, but, you know, the kind of general, you know, and, and Pavanelli draws on Rancière's notion of aesthetics and his mm. notion of political subjectivity and his distinction between politics and policing. Mm -hmm. well, the state operates as policing. Politics operates precisely through the generation of new forms of like, subjectivities. So to, to live otherwise, to feel otherwise, to desire otherwise, to endure within, you know, these forces of neoliberalism and nationalism and, uh, you know, while that, that creates in a sense of basis, I think, in which more formal politics can emerge. And I think I've observed this in Johannesburg, as I said, you know, you had these unlawful occupations where people were living otherwise, but they weren't formally politically mobilized or organized. And I think that provides the basis for a more formal political form of resistance. And I think one could you know, say the same for, you know, uh, Pavanelli's work on the queer mm -hmm. movement or other mm -hmm. work in queer theory that, that the effect of desire is political as a form of subversion, but that can also manifest in, into a larger scale um, political movement, feminism and so on, which really then challenges the the forces of the state economics institutions but that's i think quite a long discussion yeah i haven't heard uh, you know like um, i was would be interested Juan or, or some of your students to to reflect a bit on the kind of long-term impact of internal displacement in Colombia and how mm. that is, is still understood 
Mm. And, um, you know, and so Juan, maybe you or, or someone else could, could speak to that a bit, because I'd really like this also to be a kind of a dialogue. No, I, I, I am afraid that perhaps my students want to have lunch because they're not here anymore. <laughs> But, but yes, actually, my work has been dedicated to work with IDPs, no? And 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 from the beginning, uh, I started to work this like a couple of decades, no? In the 1990s, more or less, no? And what struck me precisely, what we really like about your work is the more or less the, although we have a sort of like a soft regime for IDPs, no? Never as, as a stable and rigid regime as the one of refugees, no? Uh, and Colombia has almost like champion the first law for for managing IDPs and all that. No, even though we have that what I call that fetishism of the law. No, that uh, a lot of of decrees we have a constitutional court that has actually defended the rights of IDP. You know, but at the same time we don't have camps as as, as you said. No, what I have less IDPs moving almost like a, a spectral way through the cities. No. Uh, there are, there's the very little like movements or political like formal organizations of IDPs. No, I work with with one of that, but in terms of IDPs you, you are, are very invisible. They, they live between the cities. Uh, they, they move between the cities. So 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 more or less, what I really like about your work is that the idea of the political in terms of like a, of a classical leftist approach of a stable moment of a current organization you know, of the idea of, of, of improvement of the idea of, of empowerment and all that actually does not work very much actually when you see idps living in the city they are just they, they, they are just there they're just like a fighting managing to get to the next day uh, doing a lot of juggling between 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 cooking, going to workshops, and, and all that. No, so what, what? So for me, I like this this, this work. I don't know if you, if you like this. If you know him. They say work of the Brazilian anthropologist Joao Viel. Joao Viel, you know him. Yes. Uh, Joao Viel has this concept of the spaces of zones of social abandonment. No, so I really like that idea because you have this. Let's say that's the weak minimum by a political state. That are trying to to manage this population, no? but in again, but at the same time, you have a, a almost like a a, a decrease, a, a, an abandonment of this population, right? So, 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 so that's what much about your your work that we don't have like these big organizations, but have like a, a a very anonymous wave of IDPs lingering through the, through the, through the cities and all that. So more or less, I, I will I will say that. Yeah, I think that's that's very interesting, and and the work of Bill is is also very valuable. I think for students, you know, in his work in HIV AIDS, but also in in Vita life, you know, because his his notion of abandonment is not outside of the state. You know, in the sense it connects with Pavanelli, these zones of abandonment, people have many connections with politics and so on. So it's not a zone outside; it's a zone within these systems of of power and. That book, Vita, is, is really yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that this is, uh, you know, a really interesting space of, you know, a very critical space at the moment of uh, within Brazil and Latin America, because, I mean, Brazil now, I mean, you know, is in an absolutely disastrous political moment. I mean, Bolsonaro is and manifestation of this huge repressed history of white violence, colonial genocide, and, and you know, is an existential threat, you know, and, and in a way, you know, yesterday, you know, Lula's uh, conviction was overturned, but, but I think, you know, and I think that's great. I think but potentially, you know, Lula has the capacity, is one of the Maybe the only person who has the capacity to to beat Bolsonaro, but I think there is also a failure of the left in that. Why do we? Is it one person that has the capacity to resist? You know, and Brazil has these very, as I said, these very extraordinary, deep-rooted movements. Um, but 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 what is happening politically, and and also I think now. 
which you haven't had in the past with uh, this is something interesting you know uh, i think that there was that regularization of, of venezuelans in, in colombia recently but you know brazil you've also had in recent years which hasn't been a feature of brazilian life the emergence of of xenophobia against venezuelans haitians and so on and so whereas brazil brazilian nationalism historically has has not um Brazilian nationalism historically has has not been grounded on on xenophobia, but rather this kind of myth of a racial democracy. Now these other movements are, are starting to appear, and I think, you know, the politics in in Latin America is, you know, you know, really is undergoing a form of transformation both on the the right and I think by necessity on on the left. So I think, you know. It, I mean, we can't discuss here, but I think this could be a you know very interesting space to think about these issues in relationship to Colombia. I can't hear. Sorry. Anything? Hey, Alex, le podemos dar a Dorotea micrófono? Sorry about this. It always happens. <laughs> Alex, Andrea. Profe, si quiere, les abro el micrófono a todos. Oh, sí, sí, mejor, sí, de buenas. Okay, he's going to, to give us access to all of us. <laughs> Dorotea. Listo, profe. Ya okay. pueden abrir sus micrófonos. He will turn all the markers off own, okay? So we can speak. Mm -hmm. Alex. Alex. Señor, sí, señor. Ya. Ya pueden abrir su micrófono, sí. Okay. Now, now you can put your 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 microphone. Eh, Dorotea. Yeah, good. Sorry, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, Juan, I was just not, I was just giving you a sign that we couldn't hear you. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. I'm sorry, it's okay. Good. No, no. okay. Maybe Marion no. could ask her a follow up question. <laughs> yeah, I had a question. I mean, I'm, I'm really, I'm, uh, it's bothering me, and um, um, it connects to the question of the political. I can hear my echo, it's really nervous. <laughs> So um, when we think about the voice and narrating migration um, politics, narrating migration stories, etc., migration land landscapes, when does our responsibility, like coming from this violent background that we all have, what we have, um, uh, demand from us stopping to to have a voice and giving the voice to others or or not giving giving it but but becoming like becoming mediators becoming publishers becoming um teachers and stepping out of the out of the position of the narrator Do, um, is it clear what I mean? It's... I mean, I think that's the the kind of political work which is beyond the text. You know, I think you one's work is within the text, but one's work is without. You know, and, mm -hmm. and the minute one writes a text, one is the narrator in a sense. You, you know, as I said, one can do more participatory methods, and and these can be really valuable. Um, but they can also be problematic and just necessarily get because you know there's this kind of tyranny of participation that you one can kind of exploit the time and labors of others you know and then what happens to that that work where are those products you know 
but you know i think the the work i'm doing more recently which is very influenced i think by the the kind of Freudian uh, tradition mm. of critical pedagogy you know it's um you know we do workshops with this group the inner city federation who represent inner city groups on media communication on writing on the you know, art workshop and so on and, and and i think this was very inspiring for me to see in brazil is the forms of solidarity and connection by brazilian academics with with um, civil movements, you know, not just artists, but engineers, architects, and so on. You know, in South Africa, we, we do, but often it's people in the humanities are politically involved, but we are the engineers, you know, you know, and and I saw in Sao Paulo, which was very inspiring, you know, architects who are working with anthropologists who are collaborating with housing movements. And again, writing is not everything. One's capacity, mm -hmm. the impact of writing is, is something and I think it has value you know because it opens ourselves up to di different worlds to to telling forms of stories but but as you know if we have resources and um, capacity there are other ways of engaging you know and other ways of enabling others to to tell their own stories and you know, and this goes back to a very deep debate of as an academic or, you know, should one be an activist or isn't there a role for more distance view? And again, I don't have any answers. You just have to, I think, in the work we do, we have to pose the question and, and there are different pathways that we, you know, and, and it will never be a totally satisfactory answer, you know, I think that we we exist in a space where, but I think for students, I think, you know, because part of our work as teachers too is to, you know, I mean, that's, you know, we have a, uh, ma many students from working class households. And so the, the way of teaching writing or teaching is also to, to give space for students to find their voices, to explore politically, to mm. to find avenues to give different, and to acknowledge that maybe on mm. on some topics one is one's own voice is irrelevant, and that's okay. Maybe it's mm. fine just to be quiet. You know? <laughs> they might struggle Good. with that. <laughs> Good. Good. Um, Matthew, thank you, thank you very much. It's 2 p.m. here in Bogota. <laughs> what time do you have in Brazil? Like 5 p.m., I guess? No, 3, yeah, 5, 4 p.m. It's 4. And I guess in Germany, you're at what time, Marion? 8 p.m. 8 p.m., okay. So really, really, really thank you. Thank you, Matthew. It was a beautiful talk. Um, of course, this is just beginning. Uh, we will surely continue to invite you to our to our courses. No, we do have to 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 exchange a lot of a lot of ideas. No, to let our students tell tell them about tell you about their the research and all that. No, uh, but really this was this was perfect. Really, thank you very much. So uh, your, your 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 discussion about writing and ethics it's it's also crucial for us. No. So really, really thank you much. I don't know if anyone wants to have a final, final question or commentary. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for inviting me. It, it's, it's been very important. And, and as I said, I'm happy to share the writings, but I'd be also very interested to, to if you could share some of the work that you've been doing within the various departments. It's, it's always valuable to, to read. So I, I think I can. I cut someone, there's a slight delay. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, also yeah. from my side, thank you so much. I mean, uh, our class just started, but would love to show you what our students will produce in the end. And it would be wonderful to, to stay in touch. We haven't thought about this effect dimension and the politics of ethics mm -hmm. here, but I feel this is, there's a lot to explore. And I'm also very thankful for bringing um, Beth Belli in as a reference. Mm -hmm. 
I'm joining as an art historian. I'm really not from the field, but uh, I know her work quite well, and it's it's very inspiring to attach to to to, to what we're thinking about. So th thank you very much. I would love to us to stay in dialogue and continue. Good. Thank yeah. Thank you from my side as well. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks okay. to all of you. I really okay. appreciate it. This is just the beginning of a conversation, okay? <laughs> Matthew, bye bye. Bye bye to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.